The GameStop circus moves on, and investors turn to hopes of more help from Congress and of more vaccines on their way. This is Bloomberg Wall Street Week. I'm David Weston. This week, contributors Larry Summers of Harvard. You can't look at some of the things that are happening and say there's no froth in the marketplace. And former IBM CEO Sam Palmisano. If you look at the most recent CEO appointments over the past couple of years, they all have cloud experience. Senator Shelley Moore Capito of West Virginia. Former CFPB head Richard Cordray. City Global Chief Economist Catherine Mann. Council on Foreign Relations Senior Fellow Sebastian Malaby. The beauty uh, of hedge funds is that through their long history, they've proven to be small enough to fail. And Jacob Kierkegaard of the Peterson Institute. We began the week still focused on retail investors taking stocks and even silver for a wild ride. But as the week went on, the frenzy faded, leaving regulators to pick up the pieces. What I think a mistake would be is if we take this opportunity and uh, it's used to uh, voice more regulation on those that want greater access. And leaving investors to go back and take a look at the fundamentals. Fundamentals like the jobs numbers, which moved back into positive territory, even as we learned that we were climbing out of a deeper hole from December than we had thought. Numbers that President Biden took as one more reason to press forward on a very large further round of economic support. I'm not cutting the size of the checks. They're going to be $1,400, period. That's what the American people were promised. And most important, reassurance from the administration that it's making good on its promise to put attacking the pandemic as its number one priority. And it's starting to increase, even modestly, the supply of vaccine. Starting on February 11th, the federal government will deliver vaccines directly to select pharmacies across the country. And it's not just the promise of stimulus or vaccines driving the market. Corporate earnings are coming in better than we expected, with big tech companies like Alphabet and Amazon regaining their mojo. The e-commerce giant capped a blowout quarter with the announcement of Jeff Bezos stepping down as CEO. I will reiterate that Jeff is not leaving. He is uh, getting a new job. And what did the markets do in the face of all this? Well, the equity markets pretty much took off bouncing back from a big down week to set new records for the S&P 500 and the Nasdaq, posting their best results since early November, while the Russell 2000 did its best since last June, while Treasury sold off a bit, adding 10 basis points to the yield on the 10-year. And the spread between the two-year and the 10-year was the steepest that it's been for four years. To take us through the fundamentals and what they should be telling investors, we welcome now Catherine Mann. She is City Global Chief Economist. Catherine, welcome back. Always great to have you here. Give us your sense. If you look, as you look at the economic numbers right now, where are we in the recovery? Well, you know, the recovery has faded a little bit, and, and that's not news to anybody, but it just shows up in increasing amount of data, uh, particularly the employment numbers. I mean, th there, are some, there are some good numbers out there on the PMIs, but the, the employment numbers are where the rubber really hits the road for people, and those small increases this time around, about 50,000. Uh, you know, what? when you dig down in the numbers there, um, there was an increase of 97,000 in temporary workers, but that meant the net being 50, there's basically 50,000 lost across the board, even in those sectors such as manufacturing and construction that had been bright spots in terms of uh, employment recovery over the last few months. So uh, this is a very soft employment number, and it does uh, you know, create additional pause for when the U.S. economy is actually going to regain the pre-COVID level of GDP. I want to pick up on the manufacturing numbers yeah. specifically, Catherine, because last time we were together, you were pointing out it's a different sort of a shape of recovery depending on whether it's manufacturing and construction on the one hand versus leisure and hospitality on the other. You said it's more of a V when it comes to manufacturing and construction and more of an L, unfortunately, with leisure and hospitality. Did the numbers today make you rethink those letters a little bit? Because as you say, the manufacturing and the construction were a bit softer than we expected. Well, I think, you know, the, 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 the definition of V versus L really does stick around. Um, 
and may in fact become stronger going forward if the new set of stimulus uh, activities, uh, unemployment benefits and stimulus checks go out there because until people can actually go out and buy consumer discretionary services, they are going to continue to rotate their spending into the manufactured goods and into housing, uh, which is of course very supportive of retail uh, residential construction. Uh, but until we really get a change in consumer behavior that comes from getting the vaccine, that comes from being comfortable to get out there, that comes from having the businesses actually be out there to, to be, uh, be, be purchased. Are you, are you going to go to the restaurant? Well, you need a restaurant to go to. Are you going to go to the theater? You need the theater to go to. Are you going to go travel? Well, borders have to be open. So until we really get a change in consumer behavior and in business behavior, we're not going to see that improvement in the job creation across those sectors that are very, very labor intensive. Councilor, give us a sense of how far we are off the mark. That is to say, if you had a track of potential for the economy before the pandemic and where we are now, what's that gap look like? Well, as I say, we're not actually back to where we were in January uh, just a year ago. Uh, that uh, timetable, uh, if you were optimistic, you might have said it was going to be the, you know, the late sec uh, first, half, uh, first quarter, uh, early second uh, quarter. But it really seems to be moving off into the, to the second half of the year. And that, again, is because the vaccination, uh, the discoveries, of course, fabulous. Uh, you know, we couldn't do it without discoveries. But there are many other links in the chain in order to actually get to the economic improvement and employment improvements. You've got your, you know, you've got your distribution, you've got your manufacturing, again, consumer behavior, business response and at least in the global context and to a certain extent even in the in the local uh, US context we have to be talking about border closures the comfort that people have by moving out of their comfort zone their local neighborhoods where they're more familiar and we have a long way to go for that a lot of the talk this week was about the stimulus package that President mm -hmm. Biden is proposing mm -hmm. and he's really moving forward pretty aggressively on 1.9 trillion dollars what would that do for the economy assuming it gets through Congress well, I really think that we have to think, uh, kind of gauge when it's going to come out and what people are going to do with it and what they can do with it. Uh, so far, um, there has been you know, a substantial amount of, of, of life preservers. I call these, these uh, fiscal transfers, the unemployment benefits and the stimulus checks. These really are life preservers more than they are stimulative because people, they are making up for losses that people, uh, you know, income losses and wage losses and job losses that they've been they've been burdened with. Um, and so you spend it on something, you've been spending it on your new housing, uh, stuff to put in your house, technology and so forth. That's all very supportive of manufacturing. But again, the new set to come out, um, are we going to be able to see that money going into discretionary consumer services activities? Uh, will we be ready? To, uh, will the services sectors be ready? Will there uh, be jobs in those services sector? Will there be increasing employment? Will people feel comfortable? Will they be vaccinated yet? Um, if the money gets out there, it's great uh, for those who need it, of course. Uh, but when we think about the spending patterns, it could go into more goods or be saved uh, if the services sector in the economy is not ready yet and the vaccines aren't prepared yet. Very briefly, very brief, Catherine, yeah. are you worried they may just save it? I think a lot of people will be saving it, yes. Um, okay, thank you so much. That will be good in the second half, but, but not right now. Exactly, sooner or later. Okay, thank you so yeah. much to Catherine Mann of City. Coming up, sorting through the aftermath of the GameStop frenzy. Sebastian Malaby of the Council on Foreign Relations tells us what he thinks went right and wrong. With respect to Robinhood and the fact that it had to close down access to trading on certain stocks, that's the kind of market interruption which regulators ought to take action on. This is Wall Street Week on Bloomberg. It seems as if everyone in America with access to a microphone has been telling us this week with stunning hindsight precisely why the Dow Jones Industrials took a record 508-point, 22.6% nosedive Monday. Time alone will tell whether Black Monday enters the history book as the day American confidence was so shaken that a premature recession resulted. That was Louis Rukeyser on Wall Street Week back in 1987 after Black Monday. 
Markets have been shaken again over the past two weeks as Reddit day traders boosted shares of companies like GameStop and sent short selling hedge funds running with long short funds losing 6% overall last month and Melvin Capital alone plummeting 53%. But most hedge funds emerged unscathed and Steve Cohen's 0.72 even attracted $1.5 billion in new money. I assume hedge funds are probably reluctant to short uh, small cap stocks right now for the fear that the Reddit uh, brigade might be behind those. But by early this week, GameStop's to the moon rally started to come back toward Earth and not even the Reddit flash mob or changes at the top of the company could get the irrational exuberance going again, reminding us why hedge funds and short sellers target companies like GameStop. The investor that gets caught in the updraft on that and doesn't understand that investing while it looks like it's all going up. Did the person who clicked the last buy understand that that could happen to them that quickly? I asked Council on Foreign Relations senior fellow Sebastian Malaby if anything will fundamentally change in the hedge fund world. I think that hedge funds, which of course go back to the 60s at least, um, have proven to be an amazingly robust platform from which to think creatively about risk. Um, and so they adapt, you know, they get new stuff gets thrown in their ways. When they began, there was no such thing as trading currencies because currencies were all fixed together. Bond markets hardly existed. You had to trade stocks by appointment. Uh, and they adapted all the way through that as everything changed. You know, fintech, um, the advent of Reddit, the advent of Robinhood. This is just the latest iteration in a long, long history of financial innovation. And every time hedge funds figure it out. Uh, you also have regulators trying to figure it out, as it were, after the fact. We have the Treasury Secretary Janet Yellen now saying uh, she's meeting with regulators saying we need to take a hard look at this about the volatility and whether this might actually put in jeopardy some investors. We also have hearings in Congress coming up. Uh, do you expect there might be some tweaking, at least, of the regulations? I think with respect to Robin Hood and the fact that it had to close down access to trading on certain stocks, that's the kind of market interruption which regulators ought to take action on. Um, you need the infrastructure of trading uh, to be robust. You, you, know, you need to look at the plumbing, as some regulators put it. Um, so I think that part of the system will definitely deserve a fresh look. But we certainly had some large hedge funds who, who took a big hit. Uh, and I wonder whether that did suggest there could be systemic risk here. Well, the beauty uh, of hedge funds is that through their long history, they've proven to be small enough to fail. Uh, they're not too big to fail, they actually can blow up. And people often cite long-term capital management in 1998 uh, as the big exception. Actually, if you go back and look at that incident, the New York Fed convened the banks to recapitalize it, but no taxpayer money, zero, went in. So freestanding hedge funds, I'm not counting here the subsidiary of Bear Stearns that went wrong in 08. But freestanding hedge funds have never had a taxpayer bailout. Melvin Capital has not needed a taxpayer bailout. That's the good thing about hedge funds. And so that raises the larger, the largest question maybe, does this all matter? I mean, it was good fun to watch from the sidelines. Certainly some people were hurt, some people were benefited, but ultimately to the markets and to investors for that matter, does this all matter? Does it matter? Sure, it's interesting that um, more individual participation in stock trading is a rising force. I think that FinTech will be here to stay and will continue to drive changes in the characteristics of markets. But I don't think it has to be destabilizing so long as the infrastructure um, is sound and you don't get interruptions in trading or the failure of a big clearinghouse. Uh, Sebastian, is there a potential connection to larger macroeconomic policy? Uh, we're seeing various I won't call them bubbles, but certainly spurts in various places. Look at Bitcoin, the way it shoots up and comes down, shoots up again. Uh, is this in part, perhaps, because there's so much liquidity being pumped into the global financial marketplace, led, of course, by the Federal Reserve, but also the ECB, the Bank of Japan? Well, you're absolutely right, of course, that we've seen unprecedented um, liquidity pumped into the system worldwide. If you look at the stimulus after the 08 financial crisis, uh, it was a fraction of the size of this COVID uh, injection of money. And we know from experience that you pump a lot of money into the system. It doesn't always create inflation and normal prices. You know, your eggs in your grocery store might be okay, but the nest eggs, they go up. And that's what you've been seeing in asset markets all over the place. Um, and I think that is froth. I don't agree with Chairman Powell when he plays that down. 
I think it doesn't matter if a particular cryptocurrency goes up and goes down. You know, that's the problem with the people trading that stuff. I think the same about a specific stock like, stock like GameStop. But when the whole system goes up, what we know is that the last two recessions in the United States, um, the 2001 recession was off the back of the NASDAQ crash in 2000. Uh, and of course, the 08, 09 recession was off the back of the subprime crash. So we've moved away from a world in which traditional business inventories adjust and that causes a recession into a world where it's financial imbalances that cause recessions. And so I do think the Fed needs to care about that. It's a balancing act. You want to print a lot of money when the economy is really in bad shape. But there is this risk that you create froth, bubbles, and then ultimately instability. Uh, what is the track record of the Fed trying to deal with that? Because I don't think it's been a very uh, happy one. Well, they've had a philosophy of clean up afterwards. And uh, in their own telling of the story, they did that pretty well uh, after the NASDAQ crash in 2000. And hey, there was only a very shallow recession. I don't take that view myself because actually the response to that recession in terms of very low interest rates, if you remember the Fed was down at 1% on the federal funds rate in 2003, um, that was super low at the time. And that definitely contributed to the real estate bubble that then took hold afterwards. So I think, you know, you get a bubble, you throw enormous amounts of monetary stimulus to try and fix it, that creates a new bubble, it's even bigger, even more monetary stimulus comes off the back of that. And I do think we're in a cycle where um, the Fed's kind of standard line, which is, don't worry about bubbles, we'll just clean them up afterwards. I'm not sure that's the best strategy. Thanks to Sebastian Malaby of the Council on Foreign Relations. The extreme volatility and volume of trading in stocks like GameStop and AMC caused brokerages like Robinhood to step in and impose limits, leaving regulators to ask whether there was any wrongdoing along the way, even while they recognize there's no putting the social media genie back in that bottle. Technology innovation is the way forward. We have to embrace it. You can't put it back in the box. The idea that you're going to stop Reddit that's been around for quite a while uh, is kind of absurd. Former CFPB director Richard Cordray thinks regulators should act before retail investors get hurt. I'm all for people having a lot of latitude to free trade and securities. On the other hand, if the market gets driven by speculative frenzy, it becomes tulip mania, and there are a lot of people who will get hurt. If there are people holding GameStop at very high values right now uh, and the underlying fundamentals do not support it, they're going to end up losing a lot of money in the long run, even though they may have made money in the short run, and it's a concern. And by the way, it also reinforces the Biden administration needs to have its financial regulatory officials on the job, uh, and they're going to need to get pushed through and confirmed in a hurry. Uh, by the Senate in order to be able to address these kinds of problems that are arising right now. Well, so let's go back to the CFPB that you were the first director of. Uh, as I recall, it came out of concerns about what happened to consumers coming out of the great financial crisis, 2008, 2009, where there was a frenzy, one might say, in the mortgage market and some people got hurt. What was the solution then and does it apply to what we're seeing now potentially? Yes, and you're absolutely right. The 2008 crisis was driven by failures in the mortgage market. Uh, there was a huge impetus to reform in the mortgage market. Congress directed it. The CFPB carried it out. Uh, those reforms were very solid, and the mortgage market recovered and has been very strong even now in the current economic downturn. Uh, and that's because mortgages are more fundamentally sound. Uh, we don't have a huge amount of, uh, of, of mispricing in that market, and we don't have people with bad loans who are going into foreclosure. Uh, the difference in this crisis is that it wasn't driven by any particular segment of the economy, but by a pandemic. Uh, nonetheless, consumers end up hurt if they're unemployed, if they're not having the revenue they expect, uh, if they can't uh, engage in spending and can't repay their debts. That's the, the problems we're facing now. And the CFPB has a job to do to oversee how the financial companies are handling consumers right now. That was Richard Cordray, the first director of the Consumer Financial Protection Bureau. Coming up, Italy turns to Mario Draghi to put together a government, even as it and all of Europe struggle to overcome the pandemic. Fundamentally, Italy's problem is its low growth. This is Wall Street Week on Bloomberg.
This is Wall Street Week. I'm David Weston. Europe was on the mind of global Wall Street this week as the Bank of England met to consider the state of the British economy. And Italy asked the former president of the European Central Bank, Mario Draghi, to form a government to deal with the Italian economy. Jacob Kierkegaard, senior fellow at the Peterson Institute for International Economics, says he has his work cut out for him. His basic problem is that he's a technocrat and currently the biggest party in the Italian parliament, uh, which is also currently in the government, the Five Star Movement, basically rose to its prominence in protest against the repeated technocratic government led by you know, other Marios, Mario Monti during the uh, Euro crisis some years ago. Uh, so they are going to face, you know, they're gonna have a very hard time supporting yet another technocrat. Uh, and obviously, you have other parties, particularly on the right and the far right in Italy, uh, that are currently in opposition. They would love to have an election because they are going to, uh, at least according to the polls, they're going to be uh, winning those elections. Then you have the traditional center-right party, the PD party in Italy. Uh, their main concern is uh, to remain in power, to be in a position to help pick the next Italian president, uh, which actually, in my opinion, may very well turn out to be Mario Draghi. But that uh, uh, president is only, the next president is only selected early next year. Uh, so what I think we're looking at here is a sort of temporary technocratic government under the leadership of Mario Draghi that will probably be able to uh, competently handle and begin the implementation of the EU's uh, big recovery fund that basically is a big fiscal stimulus also in Italy. But I strongly doubt that Mario Draghi will be able to put together a governing majority in both houses of parliament that's really going to be able to implement many of the economic reforms that Italy needs and that indeed Mario Draghi, when he was at the ECB, was advocating for countries like Italy. Well, that's what I wanted to ask. I mean, we all like fiscal stimulus. It gets us over, it ties us over, but you have to have structural reform at some point, I think. What is the structural reform that he would have to try to pursue in Italy if, in fact, Mario Draghi were to form a government? Well, I think there are several. I mean, fundamentally, Italy's problem is its low growth. Uh, a lot of that has to do with its demographic outlook, but it's also uh, very deep-rooted issues concerning the industrial structure in Italy. There is a, a lot of very small family-owned businesses that find it difficult to expand beyond their local markets, expand in, uh, or invest in enough IT. So he basically has to try to oversee a set of comprehensive reforms that will, uh, if you like, see consolidation of large parts of the in Italian Italian industrial sector. Uh, this isn't something that happens overnight. Uh, he's also going to have to continue to make reforms to push more Italian women into the labor market, into the labor force. Sorry, uh, Italy has arguably the lowest uh, female labor force participation of all major industrialized countries. So. With this demographic outlook, this is the biggest pool of untapped uh, labor resources that it needs to tap into if it's going to have growth going forward. That was Jacob Kierkegaard of the Peterson Institute. Coming up, big tech gets big earnings, but that doesn't keep Jeff Bezos at the helm of Amazon. Sam Palmisano ran IBM and he says it's understandable. If you're the founder like Jeff, I can imagine it's a very, very difficult decision to make. This is Wall Street Week on Bloomberg. Everything Store is getting a new CEO. Amazon's founder, Jeff Bezos, is stepping down to become executive chairman later this year. I will reiterate that Jeff is not leaving. He is uh, getting a new job. Over the last 25 years, under Bezos' leadership, an idea for an online bookstore evolved into a $1.7 trillion company that changed the face of retail. Like many Silicon Valley success stories, Amazon started in a garage after Jeff Bezos left his job in 1994. In the late 1990s, the startup expanded its offerings from books and music to include consumer goods. I emailed a, a, a thousand randomly selected customers and asked them, besides the things we sell today, what would you like to see us sell? I remember one of the answers was, 
I wish you sold windshield wiper blades because I really need windshield wiper blades. And I thought to myself, we can sell anything this way. Even after Amazon went public, it failed to turn a profit until 2001. Bezos' business model of keeping inventory low and selling products for low prices saved the company during the dot-com bubble, even as peers like Pets.com went bust. He obviously is going to have huge influence still, but it's going to be more from a vision and strategic perspective. Bezos returned to his passion for books when Amazon released its first Kindle in 2007, changing the way people read books. While building an e-commerce empire, Bezos also wears a couple of other hats as the owner of the Washington Post and founder of the space company Blue Origin. I think it leaves Jeff Bezos able to concentrate on building rockets and the things that he wants to do with someone at the helm that he can really trust. More recently, Amazon's profit engine has been its cloud computing arm, Amazon Web Services, which launched in 2003. AWS accounted for 60% of Amazon's operating income in 2020, making Amazon the world leader in cloud computing. And so it should come as no surprise that Bezos' successor will be the man who runs AWS, Andy Jassy. I think it's underappreciated just how amazing and innovative and important to everything that goes on basically in technology today that AWS is and was. Wall Street Week contributor Sam Palmasano ran IBM, and he says it's understandable that Jeff Bezos has decided to make the transition. Well, it's a, really a hard thing to do. I mean, for, especially when you've built the company. I mean, uh, one thing, I was nine to 10 years as CEO, and I grew up in IBM. I love IBM, obviously, but it wasn't mine. It wasn't my creation. It was the Watson family. And so if you're the founder like Jeff, I can imagine it's a very, very difficult decision to make. However, at the same time, he's really not leaving the company because he's still executive chairman, so he still has a role. Uh, but at the same time, his role at the company is going to be different. The company is different at this point as well. It's not at this meteoric rise that it's had. It's now getting besieged by the government. Yeah, well, that's exactly, it's quite interesting, as you know, and the same things happened to other companies. We've talked about Microsoft, IBM, AT&T. And, it's, I, I would you know, I look back on it, it comes with success. I mean, when you're that successful and you get that large, people are going to come after you. And usually it's your competition, quite honestly, but then they lobby the various government entities and then politics takes over and then you go, well, find yourself in these difficult situations. In my experience, the founders have a very hard time with that. They can't understand how that could happen. I'm not saying that's the case for Jeff, but my experience with both talking with Bill Gates and spending a lot of time, because I used to support Mr. Watson Jr. Uh, as when I was executive assistant to the chairman and the CEO of IBM. Uh, and I had firsthand conversations with him. So you could see as a founder why that was a very hard thing for him to psychologically cope with. Well, I mean, you ran a big company that was under siege from the government. Is it possible, not just for psychological reasons, not, not as much fun to defend, but also for the sake of the company, is it better to have somebody a little more detached where it's not literally their child? I think that, that is, that's the way to think about it. I mean, basically what happened in IBM's example, um, and I spent a time with Tom Watson and then it was Frank Carey who became chairman and then John Opel who became CEO. But Mr. Watson uh, made a decision and he was still the founder and the majority shareholder, but made a decision that Kerry would become chairman and work with the government and try to resolve the suit and John would run the company. So there really was a kind of a division of responsibilities. I think that's really, really important because it's really hard not to get distracted. If you look what happens long-term over these suits, IBM, we missed a thing called client server. Microsoft obviously did extremely well there. Microsoft missed the internet, you know, and I think it's distraction. I really think a lot of that is because when you are the CEO and you're also dealing with the government suit between the le legal pressures and the advice you're getting from counsel on how you should proceed and how you should set strategy, the company gets distracted for a period of time. In our case, that was almost 10 years. In Microsoft's case, I think it was more than 10, maybe 12, AT&T. You know, that happens. And then as a result of that, you miss these big technological shifts. One of the things that uh, no one's been distracted from is the cloud. Uh, the dramatic rise in the cloud, including at Amazon, not limited to Amazon. It's probably no coincidence that the person succeeding Jeff Bezos really was running the cloud operation at Amazon. What do you make of that change in technology overall, that huge move into the cloud? 
Well, it's interesting because if you and if you think about where Amazon began, they were selling as you know tapes and books on the internet, basically. Right now, they're the largest uh, pr provider of cloud services through AWS, which you know, as you know, Andy was running uh, at Amazon. Now, having said all that, uh, it's a huge transition of the infrastructure. I think a thing you might find of interest today is, is that if you look at the most recent CEO appointments over the past couple of years, they all have cloud experience. Mm -hmm. Amazon, Google, Microsoft, IBM, right? So that indicates that the, uh, the leadership of those companies have concluded that the skill set required for the future is someone who understands those technologies that are going to transition those companies and those business models into this cloud era and put on top of that artificial intelligence. It's a compounding of both of those things, but all those people have those backgrounds. Uh, so I think there's a, it's an interesting pattern emerging here when it comes to leadership of these tech companies. That was former IBM CEO, Sam Palmisano. Coming up, the prospects for another round of fiscal stimulus. Senator Shelley Moore Capito of West Virginia says Democrats are committed to getting it done one way or the other. The quickest way to get here is a bipartisan bill where we have uh, a lot of agreement. This is Wall Street Week on Bloomberg. This is Wall Street Week, I'm David Weston. President Biden pressed his case for another $1.9 trillion in stimulus money to support the U.S. economy, including meeting at the White House with 10 Republican senators who have proposed a compromise package that would get bipartisan support. We talked with one of those who met with the president, Senator Shelley Moore Capito of West Virginia, for her take on that meeting. We had a two-hour meeting with the president in the Oval Office. It was a great exchange of ideas, and we talked about more targeted reform and, and kind of took apart a little bit his $1.9 trillion. He didn't make any promises. He listened intently. He was very well prepared, and he seemed to be interested, in, particularly in the targeting numbers on individual checks in terms of do we really want to be sending checks to families that are making $300,000 a year whose lives really have not changed? And so I think that was the biggest area that he signaled that he might make some, uh, make some adjustments, but we, that's yet to be seen. There are some reports on the Bloomberg, actually, about the very point you just made, that if you really look at the upper end before it really phases out, there are some people who are making a fair amount of money and, as you say, maybe didn't lose their jobs. Do you have an approach in your compromise proposal to deal with that, and did the president indicate maybe that made sense? that sort of approach? Well, what we did was we lowered the uh, the income level of which you would be available to get a stimulus check to about 150000 per couple. And we felt like, and the statistics bear out that you're using this as stimulus. This is money we want back into the economy. And at those income levels where people really are hurting, maybe can't pay their rent, buy their food, uh, they are spending their stimulus checks. If you get up into over two hundred dollars or $300,000, people are saving it or they're, they're not using it to provide that stimulus stimulus that we really need to keep this economy moving. And, and also, I think, do we want, really want to be sending taxpayer dollars to people who have had really little or no effect during this pandemic? Uh, I say no. Uh, Senator, give us a sense of the timing. If, in fact, the Democrats went by way of budget reconciliation, how long would it be likely to take? You know, I think that's a great question because this was one of the one of the selling points we thought was most powerful for uh, going in to talk with President Biden. He wants something. He kept uh, stressing urgency and timing. And so we kept saying the quickest way to get here is a bipartisan bill where we have uh, a lot of agreement. And uh, if you're going to go through budget reconciliation, what you're going to see is probably a month to six weeks. And uh, you've lost that time. So, Senator, I want to wrap this up by letting you brag on your state here a little bit because your vaccination yeah. rates in West Virginia are pretty impressive. What are you doing in West Virginia? What can you teach the rest of us? You know what we're doing in West Virginia is we're utilizing all of our local assets. Uh, the governor has done a great job along with the National Guard, our local pharmacies, our city mayors and counties, uh, our county health departments have been fantastic. The, the federal government laid out a plan for vaccination uh, delivery and, and dispensing. We went away from that and created our own plan because we know each other best. And so we have the best vac vaccine distribution in the country. We're proud of it. We have, I think, a... Um, 
a, 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 way, a, a way forward for states to get more shots in the arms quicker, and that's what we're doing in West Virginia. We have a vulnerable population, and it was really important that we get those nursing home and assisted living folks taken care of first. We knew where they all were because we've been testing them. So it's just really been a, a, um, a logistical uh, win for us, and we're really proud of it. What's that going to do for your economy? Because a lot of people are concerned if you can't get them vaccinated, you can't get people back out to restaurants and things like that. Mm -hmm. Well, our schools reopened uh, about two weeks ago, and uh, and you know there's been some pushback, like we see across the nation. But by and large, they're reopened, and that's big. Our restaurants are reopening, uh, and as we get this vaccine distribution, we get those double shots for the ones that need the two shots. Uh, I think by the time our great tourism uh, season comes along in the spring, we have a great winter one too. In the spring, uh, it's going to be great. We have a new national park in West Virginia. We were able to get at the end of the year, so we got lots to see. That was Senator Shelley Moore Capito of West Virginia. And it's time now for a look ahead on Global Wall Street. David, next week marks the start of the Great Staycation in China as the usual Lunar New Year migration is put on pause. Ahead of China's markets closing on Thursday, we'll get a pulse check on inflation and possibly credit growth on the mainland. Plus, money markets are in focus as PBOC watchers assess the central bank's stance on tightening. As for earnings in Asia, SoftBank reports alongside Japanese car makers Toyota, Nissan and Honda at a time when the global auto industry is grappling with a semiconductor shortage that is impacting production and looking to space China's mission to Mars may reach the planet next week. Danny. Thanks Sophie for the upcoming week. The focus will be on Italy and whether the former ECB head Mario Draghi can get enough support to become the premier of Italy at the moment. He's just trying to avoid an election. So we'll see who ends up backing him. We're also going to be looking out for a raft of European bank earnings that include Commerce Bank and SockGen. Scarlett. Thanks, Danny. We're all geared up for the Super Bowl on Sunday, but after that, we'll be keeping an eye on events in Washington. The Senate begins Donald Trump's impeachment trial on Tuesday. Lawyers for the former president declined an invitation for him to testify. Federal Reserve Chair Jay Powell will also speak to the Economic Club of New York on Wednesday. Now, the central banker has pledged to keep money cheap and credit available to support the pandemic hit economy, which is all the more important after a disappointing January jobs report. And of course, the earnings parade continues. Tech and media are in the spotlight with Twitter and Disney reporting quarterly numbers, along with Lyft, Uber and General Motors. David, back over to you. Thanks to Sophie, Danny and Scarlett. Coming up, we wrap up the week with special contributor Larry Summers of Harvard. This is Wall Street Week on Bloomberg. This is Wall Street Week. I'm David Weston. We're going to wrap up the week, as always, with our special contributor, Larry Summers of Harvard. So, Larry, I guess the big news really this week is about the stimulus bill, that $1.9 trillion President Biden is, prop is proposing. It was thought it might be bipartisan. Now it looks like he's going to really push it through no matter whether Republicans come on board or not. You were in the Obama administration when you went for a big stimulus package, and, and some people think you didn't go far and fast enough. Do you agree with President Biden's approach that he's got to get this thing through? Let me just first say, David, that I don't think there's any question that in retrospect, it would have been better if we'd done larger stimulus during the Obama administration. I think we understood that at the time. The constraint, uh, read President Obama's memoirs, was not an economic judgment. It was a political judgment about what could pass through the Congress, given the consensus that existed at that time, given where Republicans were and given where Democrats like Senator Kent Conrad and Byron Dorgan and Nelson uh, from Nebraska were at that time. So I think the lesson that we need more stimulus, um, we wish we'd had more stimulus is really a, a valid lesson. I'm not in a position to judge uh, the tactics. It's certainly better to do things on a bipartisan basis, but Negotiation is about leverage. And if the Democrats have no capacity to act on their own, they don't have much leverage in a bipartisan negotiation. And so if it's come to the point where they 
need to do it unilaterally, then that's where it's come to. So I'm not prepared at all to second guess uh, that uh, political judgment. It's a political judgment, not an economic uh, judgment. And it may well be necessary given the intransigence of uh, today's Republican Party. I think the really important issues, David, uh, go to how we think about fiscal policy over the course of the whole year. And we need to make sure we're supporting demand. We need to make sure that we're helping people who are in need. We need to take the kind of different perspective on fiscal policy that recent economic thinking about secular stagnation, about low rates has driven us to. But that's not a reason for blank checks. And that's not a reason why any amount of fiscal policy organized in any way um, is appropriate. And I look at the fiscal stimulus under discussion and with the $1.9 trillion, you're talking about something that relative to the GDP gap is six times as large as what we did in 2008. And if that's what we're gonna do, we need to make sure we've got a contingency plan in case we get a perfect combination of good news. Well, let's shift briefly from fiscal to monetary policy. In this program, we spoke with Sebastian Malaby, you know him, and we talked about what he refers to as froth in the markets right now because of the reasons you know so well because so, so much liquidity, and whether the Fed could really address that. And he said in history, the Fed traditionally has said, let's wait till the bubble bursts and then pick up at the aftermath. Uh, he didn't think that was necessarily an effective way to do it. Do you think there is froth in the marketplace? And is that the right approach to deal with it? I think there's, you can't look at what happened at uh, GameStop. You can't look at some of the things that are happening and say there's no froth in the marketplace. But monetary policy is a pretty blunt instrument. It touches everything from small business borrowing rates to overall stock market multiples to mortgage rates for uh, homeowners. And so unless you have pretty pervasive froth, I worry about using monetary policy as a tool and I worry about being wrong. Uh, you know, Alan Greenspan made his famous statement about irrational exuberance in the fall of 1996, when the Dow was at 6,300. In retrospect, it's pretty clear there was no froth mm -hmm. then. Everybody at the time of the 1987 crash believed that it was a product of a tremendous amount of froth that had built up in the summer of 1987. But if you look at a graph of stock prices today, it's far from clear that there was froth at uh, that time, uh, really. So I worry that you have to be very sure of yourself about froth to go running around trying to burst bubbles with the blunt instrument of monetary policy. So let's conclude with a rapid fire round of summer says and pick up on something you just said, number one, you referred to GameStop. If we end up with Robin Hood against the regulators in Washington, because the regulators are certainly going after this thing, who's gonna win? Regulators. I think you're gonna see a, a lot of attention to issues around manipulation and retail protection uh, I don't yet, I don't feel I know what the right public policy answers are, but I think there's a pretty pervasive and pretty valid sense that the spectacle of the last two weeks and the possible systemic risk that could have happened of another LTCM type situation in the last two weeks, that public policy should be working to avoid that. And I suspect that we'll see new rules and regulations. We heard this week from the Bank of England, uh, and they didn't change any of their decision making, but they once again sort of had it both ways on negative interest rates. We're not doing it now. We're not saying we're going to do it, but don't be surprised if we do it at some point down the road. When history is written, 
Will negative interest rates prove to have been a success or a failure? I don't think they're going to be remembered as a great success. I think they're going to be remembered more as a sign of desperation in a very difficult uh, time. And people are going to wish that we had used fiscal policy more actively. And so there'd been less need for monetary policy. And finally, take us forward 12 months. What will the inflation rate in the United States be? And what will the unemployment rate be? I think unemployment's going to be significantly lower than people now expect. And I think inflation, and especially inflationary expectations, are going to escalate more rapidly uh, than uh, most people uh, expect. I think we're, for the first time in a generation, going to have to contend with rising ex inflation expectations and possible inflationary psychology as a genuine issue. Um, I think we're going to be there within a year or 18 months. Okay, Larry, thank you so very much for concluding the week for us. As you always do, that's Larry Summers, our special Wall Street Week contributor from Harvard. Finally, one more thought. Everybody's doing it. No, I'm not talking about buying call options on highly shorted stocks or planning vacations for whenever they let us out of this cage that is our home or even buying a COVID puppy. No, the craze that has truly taken over the country is the SPAC, that special purpose acquisition company, begun back in 1993 as a last resort for companies that couldn't manage an IPO. SPACs have become all the rage in this world of cheap money, low returns and volatile markets that make it really hard to price a traditional IPO if you're a private company on the rise. Just raise the money without telling anyone what you want to buy, make a deal, and presto changeo, you have a public company where there was a private one. The growth is geometric. With $83 billion raised for SPACs in 2020 and the pace set so far this year looking to beat that by a good margin. I think we are at a point where <laughs> we've got more supply of, of SPACs than we do of companies that really would rationally merge into them. So if you're a former senior member of the Trump administration, what do you do next? Well, for former Commerce Secretary Wilbur Ross, you create a SPAC. And whom do you bring in to help you run it? Former director of the National Economic Council, Larry Kudlow. They've announced plans to raise $345 million for their new SPAC. They haven't said what sectors they'll be looking at, although Mr. Ross has always expressed interest in the privatization of space. And Mr. Kudlow, well, Mr. Kudlow, as we know, knows the media rather well. But in the end, maybe the price is right for a big private leisure and hospitality group, something like maybe the Trump Organization. It would be one way to turn the table on your old boss. That does it for this episode of Wall Street Week. I'm David Weston. This is Bloomberg. See you next week.